Hello, hi everyone. Uh, we start the webinar of uh, this Friday. Uh, the first lecture will be, there will be a change. The first lecturer will be uh, Dr. Ramiz Malak. He is currently the head of neurosurgery at Charles Lemond Hospital, Quebec in Canada. And he is the assistant professor of neurosurgery at Sherbrooke University since 2010. He completed his residency program at the University of Montreal. Then he obtained a fellowship in epilepsy surgery at the University of Calgary. He also has a master's degree in biochemistry at McGill University. So the lecture of Professor Ramiz, epilepsy surgery. Please. Hi, I would like to thank Dr. Fatima Abdullah for inviting me to this talk. Today I'll be presenting you surgical treatment of uh, epilepsy. I have no uh, conflict of interest uh, related to this talk. First, I would like to present uh, to you the place where I work, uh, Charlemagne Hospital. This is at the south shore of uh, Montreal uh, city, and we are the referring hospital for about uh, a million population. As you all know, uh, doing epilepsy surgery implicates uh, working with a big team. This includes the neurolog uh, doing all the investigation before uh, reaching the operation. There's the EEG tech, the nurses on the floor, the radiology tech, uh, nuclear medicine, neuropsychological, neuropsychology team, um, EOR team, and uh, at the end, uh, the surgeon. And I forgot to include also the pathologist who analyzed uh, at the end. The history of epilepsy surgery is relatively recent. Knowing that the very first uh, temporal lobectomy for epilepsy was done in 1947 by Percival Bailey in Chicago, he was uh, uh, working with the two non neurologs, uh, Gibbs and Gibbs. Montreal has also a very long uh, history of uh, epilepsy research and epilepsy surgery, starting with uh, uh, Penfield and Jasper, uh, who founded the uh, uh, Montreal Neurological Institute in 1934, and then uh, many uh, very well-known uh, epilepsy surgeons that followed their track, such as uh, Rasmussen, Fendel, and Glor, and uh, lately, uh, Dr. Uh, Olivier and Anderman. When we consider epilepsy surgery candidates, we classify them as either normal uh, MRI, non-lesional uh, epilepsy, or um, lesional epilepsy with uh, uh, abnormal MRI. We definitely prefer lesional epilepsy because they do have better outcome and easier uh, pre-op evaluation. The most common uh, surgical pathologies uh, for uh, epilepsy are mesial temporal sclerosis, tumors, focal cortical dysplasias, and cavernous malformation. In the last few years, we are starting to consider epilepsy, even focal epilepsy, as a part of networks. So even if we have a clear lesion, the, uh, they might have some uh, epileptical uh, focuses away from the uh, epileptic zone. According to the International League Against uh, Epilepsy, the definition of drug-resistant epilepsy is failure of adequate trials of two tolerated and appropriately chosen and used anti-epileptic drugs schedules, whether as monotherapies or in combination, to achieve sustained seizure freedom. In their famous study, Kwan and Brody have shown that the best chance to treat epilepsy with medication is with the, the first pill. And then there's a, another 14% chance to uh, control seizure with the second medication. And then the chances get very small and uh, you end up always having one third of epilepsy patient becoming resistant to uh, uh, medication and from this one third there's half of them that could be a good seizure, uh, epilepsy uh, surgery candidates 
In another famous study by Weeb and Al in 2001, they compared seizure outcome in drug-resistant epilepsy patients going through either temporal lobectomy or medical treatment. They obtained an angle uh, class 1 outcome in 58% of the surgical group compared to only 8% in the medical group. This has also been confirmed with large epilepsy surgery series with long-term surgical outcomes up to 10 years. Uh, and different groups have shown that uh, epilepsy surgery will uh, have uh, a seizure freedom uh, somewhere between 55 and 76 percent. Here we can actually see the graphs from three uh, such studies and uh, we can see clearly that over the years the uh, effect of epilepsy surgery remains uh, high even after uh, 10 and 16 years. Now let's look at the different uh, uh, surgical approaches for uh, epilepsy surgery. Uh, first of all, there's the intracranial electrodes and then the different types of temporal lobectomies. Um, uh, then uh, extratemporal resection, um, including insular resection that have been, had had lots of uh, interest in the last few years. Um, there's the cabezotomy, hemispherectomy, uh, hypothalamic hematoma resection, and uh, more recently, radio surgery, electrical stimulation, such as uh, VNS, DBS, cortical stimulation, and uh, the uh, most popular uh, approach lately is the MRI, guided laser interstitial thermal therapy, or LIT. Intracranial electrodes can be divided as either surface electrodes or dead uh, electrodes. This is one uh, extreme case of uh, a surface uh, electrode that is covering a large area of the brain. Uh, and within the same case, we have also added uh, depth electrodes. This is a reconstruction. And this is another example of a surface electrodes where uh, we used strips uh, and they have been introduced through a burr hole instead of a big craniotomy. Surface electrodes can also use, be used during surgery as electrocorticography that can help to find uh, the area where there's lots of electrical activities to be resected at the same time as the surgery or can, can be implanted and uh, do intracranial studies at the EEG lab. Those electrodes can also be used for mapping uh, important uh, functions in the brain, such as uh, motor activity or uh, speech. And this is a case where we had to remove the tumor in the uh, motor area, uh, motor cortex, and uh, we used uh, uh, this grid to, um, to map the uh, Rolandic uh, area. Uh, and uh, remove the uh, tumor safely. The other type of intracranial electrodes are depth electrodes. And uh, this technique has been developed in France by Banco and Telerac. Uh, and we can, be, uh, we can use uh, twist drills to introduce uh, different uh, electrodes uh, in the brain. Uh, and now we can use neuro navigation to, uh, to place electrodes exactly at the area we want. This technique has gained uh, a lot of popularity in the recent years in North America, especially with the introduction of robot, where you can uh, plan beforehand the uh, different electrodes and the robot will place them at the exact places that you have planned. This save uh, lots of time for the planning of and introduction of the electrodes. Now let's move on and talk about different types of temporal lobe resections, uh, which remain the uh, most used surgical technique for epilepsy, uh, in epilepsy patients. There is the uh, classical uh, anterior temporal lobectomy uh, and uh, the more uh, minimally invasive uh, selective uh, resections. There are also different uh, 
approaches for the selective amygdaloid hippocampectomy uh, can be used uh, either by splitting the sylvan fissure as the azogel technique or the uh, superior uh, temporal uh, sulcus approach or the, the ones that we use uh, and I will present to you uh, in more details which is the uh, middle temporal gyrus approach and the aim of those uh, surgery, uh, surgeries are to remove the uh, amygdala, the hippocampus, and also the parahippocampal gyri. Some people have also described uh, approach, uh, transtentorial approach uh, to the uh, amygdala through the supra cerebellar infratentorial uh, transtentorial approach, but this sounds a little bit far fetched for me. The technique I use is the uh, middle uh, temporal gyrus approach or trans T2 uh, approach uh, and I will walk, uh, walk you through uh, the different steps of this surgery. First we do uh, positioning, uh, we immobilize the head with the uh, Mayfield uh, clamp um, and we use the neural navigation to guide through the uh, surgery and we do a linear uh, incision in the uh, temporal area. We do the skin incision and then we split the temporal muscle. Then we do a tailored uh, small craniotomy uh, using uh, neural navigation to guide uh, for the uh, craniotomy. Here the bone is removed and we can see that we have a very uh, minimal craniotomy of about two by three centimeters, which is largely sufficient to do the selective approach. Using the neural navigation, we localize the medial temporal uh, gyrus. Uh, this also can be localized uh, using the uh, skull base as a guide, uh, which is seen here superiorly. And then we do a um, uh, two to three centimeter uh, cortectomy uh, with the bipolar and uh, micro scissors uh, through the uh, length of the middle temporal gyrus. Then we go in the depth of the middle temporal gyrus uh, by suctioning the white matter uh, perpendicular to the surface using uh, a small micro suction or uh, the CUSA. As we go in the depth, we always verify with the neural navigator that we are uh, aiming towards the uh, temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. Uh, this avoid uh, going more superiorly or inferiorly. Uh, it's more dangerous to go superiorly and hit the uh, basal ganglia. Here, the ventricle is uh, the temporal horn of the uh, lateral ventricle is open and we can uh, see the hippocampus uh, through the opening of the ventricle. We increase the opening of the um, temporal horn of the lateral ventricle and its length to expose more of the hippocampus and anteriorly the amygdala. In this uh, picture, we see uh, clearly the junction between the head of the hippocampus and the amygdala nuclei, nucleus. Then we start by uh, disconnecting the uh, hippocampus and resecting the mesial temporal stru uh, structures uh, to, in a way to obtain a specimen to be analyzed in pathology. Uh, we resect uh, inferior uh, to the um, hippocampus, which we, we see at the top of the image. Uh, we are using the ultrasonic aspiration, we remove the parahippocampus inferiorly and then anteriorly we remove the uh, amygdala nuclear, uh, nucleus uh, by the same technique. And then uh, we disconnect the uh, specimen uh, from the mesial uh, uh, hippocampal uh, vessels. After uh, having the uh, hippocampal specimen, we continue removing the posterior aspect of the hippocampus using the uh, ultrasonic aspirator and we verify with the uh, neural navigation that we went posterior enough 
uh, aiming as far as the uh, quadrigeminal plate. After doing the uh, hemostasis, we uh, close the dura using a dural patch. Then we put the uh, bone flap that we fix with uh, small metallic uh, titanium uh, plates. Then we close the uh, muscle and finally we close the skin with sutures and uh, staples. This is a post-operative MRI showing the extent of the mesial temporal structures uh, resections. And this is a 3D reconstruction of the MRI showing the uh, approach the, uh, at the surface and the extent of resection of the amygdala hippocampus and parahippocampus. Callosotomy is another interesting surgical technique used in epilepsy. It is used mainly for generalized uh, type of uh, seizure and mainly the drop attack type such as Lenogasto. So let's walk again uh, through the uh, surgical technique of callosotomy. Here we have the patient that is positioned supine. Uh, we have planned the incision uh, using the neural navigation again, and we have uh, identified the uh, sagittal sinus at the midline. After doing the linear incision, we uh, tailored the uh, craniotomy uh, around the uh, midline uh, and uh, centered at the coronal uh, uh, suture. Here we are removing the bone flap, opening the dura towards the sagittal sinus while avoiding to take the uh, bridging veins that drain into the sinus. Then we dissect the interhemispheric space. Then we bring in the microscope and we continue dissecting deep into the interhemispheric uh, fissure until we meet the uh, callosal and pericallosal vessels. Here we have used cotton balls, uh, anterior and posterior, to do gentle retraction of the brain. And finally, we see in the depth the corpus callosum that is uh, glittering white uh, fibers. At this point, we start uh, suctioning the uh, corpus callosum fibers at the uh, midline uh, following the length of the corpus callosum using the ultrasonic aspirator. We continue resecting the corpus callosum over all its depth, which is about 5 to uh, 8 millimeters, depending where we are in the corpus callosum, and uh, uh, which is var a variable from one patient to another. Uh, and we keep uh, removing the corpus callosum while staying in the midline until we reach the septum pellucidum. And we can see here clearly the uh, septum pellucidum and the ependema of the two um, lateral ventricles. Again, using the neural navigation, we can verify how far anterior or posterior uh, we have reached uh, uh, of our resection. Um, so ideally you wanna reach as anterior and po as possible to reach the rostrum of the corpus callosum. And posteriorly, we have to make decision before surgery, either we're doing a complete or anterior to third uh, corpus callosotomy. Uh, uh, this depends if you wanna spare this plenium, which has language function. So if the patient has um, mental retardation and no speech function um, usually we will go ahead and do a complete uh, complete corpus callosotomy whereas if you want to uh, have uh, if you have a functional language then we would do a anterior to third and preserve the um, uh, splenium this is a 3d uh, tractography uh, representing uh, the corpus callosum before and after uh, two-thirds resection. 
And by scrolling down the images, we can see the extent of uh, the callosotomy. Now, in the recent years, uh, insular epilepsy has gained lots of interest. Many publications uh, about semiology and uh, surgery for uh, insular epilepsy have been uh, published. Uh, the insula is um, well hidden in the uh, sylvian fissure, and it's covered by the uh, sylvian arteries, so it is a relatively dangerous area to approach. Um, one way to uh, reach the uh, insular uh, region is to split the sylvian fissure and then um, resect the uh, insula in between uh, the sylvian vessels. This is an MRI showing a posterior insular resection. Um, we can do either partial or complete insular uh, resection depending on uh, where the uh, seizures are coming from. Uh, this whole insular epilepsy surgery was encouraged by um, the introduction of depth electrodes that can be uh, inserted in the insula. Another technique to remove the insula is to uh, take it um, at the same time as the operculum. Uh, for example, in this case, we have uh, cortical dysplasia um, that involves both the uh, frontum operculum and the uh, insula. So by removing the frontal operculum, that needs to be uh, removed anyway. We can continue from there and remove the insula. And in this way, we don't have to split the Sabine fissure. Other interesting techniques for uh, uh, epilepsy uh, are the hemispherectomy or hemispherotomy. Uh, those techniques have been known for a while, and they are used for catastrophic uh, seizures um, uh, in uh, pediatrics. Um, here we will not have time to go uh, through details of those surgeries. Now, epilepsy surgery has a relatively low uh, complication rates. Uh, there are many, st many studies that have uh, addressed the complication rates from epilepsy surgery. This is uh, one large study from Montreal um, that uh, have looked at uh, complication uh, at long term from uh, a series of about 2,500 uh, epilepsy surgery procedure. And uh, they found that the risk of surgical complication is about uh, 3%, including hematoma, infection, uh, subgileal fluid collection, or post-operative edema. In the same study, they looked also at their neurological uh, complication and uh, they found uh, also less than 3% minor and less uh, and about 0.5% major neurological complications. And this include hemiparesis, uh, dysphasia, hemi uh, hemianopia, quadranopia, or uh, nerve, uh, cranial nerve palsy. Of course, this depends on the type of sur surgery performed. Now I want to move on uh, to talk uh, uh, very quickly about the newest uh, surgical techniques uh, for epilepsy. This includes electrical stimulation such as VNS, D DBS, or cortical stimulation. Um, also, there is uh, radio surgery. Uh, we use endoscopy for certain type of epilepsy. And uh, more recently, uh, more and more centers are using the laser interstitial thermal therapy or LIT. VNS is a relatively uh, old technique now. 
and uh, it is used mainly in uh, uh, generalized um, epilepsy and mainly uh, for drop attack type of uh, epilepsy similar to the corpus callosotomy. Uh, it has also been used lately for other uh, pathologies such as uh, depression. Uh, this technique involves uh, putting a wired loop uh, around the vagus nerve that we dissect in the neck and there's a chargeable battery that is placed in a pocket um, either uh, in the chest. DB, uh, deep brain stimulation or DBS has also been used in some cases of epilepsy surgery. Uh, it can be used for example um, instead of resection of left uh, hippocampus in cases with uh, uh, high risk of uh, uh, memory deterioration or in cases of uh, bitemporal uh, epilepsy. RNA or responsive neurostimulation is another technique where uh, the device can detect the seizure and uh, respond by electrical shock to uh, abort the seizure. Uh, we can use uh, two, uh, two electrodes, either uh, superficial or deep, or a combination of both. Radio surgery has also been used for treatment of epilepsy surgery. Uh, this can be uh, uh, used to uh, treat mesial temporal sclerosis or other um, brain uh, lesions. Cerebral and uh, ventricular endoscopy can be also used in some cases of epilepsy surgery, such as removal of uh, hypothalamic hamartoma. Finally, the uh, newest uh, technique uh, in uh, epilepsy surgery is the introduction of the MRI-guided laser interstitial thermal uh, therapy or LIT. For this surgery, we use a stereotactic frame and uh, image fusion to guide the, uh, to plan the uh, trajectory of the uh, laser. And uh, the laser is then introduced via a small twist drill on the skin. Then the patient is taken to the MRI room for real-time visualization of ablation using MRI thermometry we want to obtain a target temperature of 60 to 80 degrees that causes tissue destruction. We can also obtain immediate MRI showing uh, scan showing the exact extent of ablation. The advantage of uh, this new technology is that we have uh, um, a discrete lesion margin, uh, immediate efficacy uh, for uh, control of seizures, uh, lower risk uh, of complication and faster recovery. Uh, normally, the patient can uh, return home the next day. In conclusion, there are various uh, new surgical, new and old surgical technique that has been developed for uh, epilepsy uh, to treat refractory seizures. Uh, multiple surgical options are available and can be offered based on the clinical presentation. Uh, the type of uh, uh, epilepsy and the patient and surgeon preferences. Um, we have uh, we can obtain high rate of seizure control with relatively low morbidity. Thank you for your attention, and now we can move on uh, for uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Professor Malak, for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, we, we have left with uh, some good time for questions and answers. Uh, well, uh, we are waiting for any questions from the audience. Uh, and this time, I will make use of my role as a moderator to ask uh, some few, uh, few questions, if you allow me. Uh, yes, is there still a place for MST, which is the multiple subbial transaction? 
in the field of epileptology, say in Landau Klebner syndrome or ESES, or etc. You are unmuted. The sound. Yeah. Now? Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks for asking this question. Uh, I Sorry, I didn't mention it in my presentation because uh, I, uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it's with all the techniques that we have, it's rare that we have to do this kind of techniques. Uh, I've seen it uh, only once during my training uh, in case where we had uh, uh, lesions in very functional areas. Um, there, there, is that, there is risk also of deteriorating. We use it mostly in... Uh, cases with uh, motor uh, uh, Rolandic seizures um, where we do uh, strips on the cortex uh, parallel, but there's uh, definitely a risk of uh, uh, weakness. Uh, and now also we have uh, many other alternatives. So I, uh, uh, in my uh, practice, uh, I, as I said, I, I don't use it that much and uh, I've seen it only once during training. Okay, thank you. Well, the second question, uh, I wonder if you have uh, practice in child or in fancy surgery, uh, epilepsy surgery. It is said that uh, within the first three years of life, there is uh, the brain plasticity trait uh, will uh, manage to compensate uh, between the functions of two hemispheres so that the sections which are done in the first three years of life uh, are bet of better prognosis than those in adults. Am I yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, I work in an adult uh, uh, hospital, but uh, during my training, I did have some exposure to uh, pediatric epilepsy surgery. Uh, uh, and uh, what I can tell you is that there, uh, there are different factors to consider when uh, to decide the timing of surgery. Uh, so uh, very early surgery, uh, the problem is uh, the weight of the child. And uh, uh, let's say in the first uh, three to six months, the, patient, the, the child are uh, very small and uh, the risk of uh, uh, they, they can have, uh, they can tolerate very badly uh, blood loss. So usually we try to, to get them at least after uh, three to six months to have enough uh, circulating blood uh, so they can uh, sustain uh, a big surgeries. Um, uh, and definitely uh, the more you wait uh, to treat epilepsy, the, the, uh, the, the worse is the outcome from surgery control, but also uh, from cognitive deterioration, because we know that the uh, multiple seizure in a young uh, brain uh, can cause uh, cognitive deterioration, which is we call uh, uh, epileptic encephalopathy that develops and have been, uh, have been studied uh, in, uh, in many places. So yes, the early, uh, the better, but at the same time, too early is a little bit higher risk also for the very, very young ch uh, children. So what is the age, smallest age or little, the age that you can do surgery for? for yeah, uh, uh, as I said, I, I have, uh, uh, I haven't done pediatric surgery for, for the last 10 years, but uh, uh, from memory, I would say uh, six months, uh, not before six months, because otherwise they would be too, too small and higher risk of, for the blood loss and uh, to sustain the, uh, the uh, general anesthesia for many hours. Well, I have a few questions, but I will uh, go to see if there is a, well, uh, a question from one of our, uh, uh, Noha Hassan, what the risk of gliosis after traditional surgery? Uh, Absolutely. What is the risk of gliosis after tradition, traditional surgery, making a new, uh, mean, the uh, bluetogenic uh, lesion? Yeah. The, the, uh, yeah. the fibrosis of I, surgery itself. I understand. I understand. Yeah. So, so scarring from surgery that cause other epilepsy. So yes. this has been discussed uh, many times. Um, and my practice is not frequently a problem. So usually, let's talk about, uh, for example, uh, the cases that we do most frequently, either lesions uh, uh, from uh, tumor lesions or uh, uh, multiple, uh, mesial temporal sclerosis. 
usually when those patients uh, fail, let's say they usually they have a good control after surgery, but then they have recurrence of seizure. So most of the time in case of tumors, this is because there's recurrence of the tumor and then patients start to seize again. Uh, we have very rarely seen patients where we operated for tumor and they had seizures at the same time. Uh, they come back for, uh, they had the long-term, long-time seizure freedom and then they come back later uh, with epilepsy only due to uh, gliosis. Most of the time it's really due to, um, uh, to scarring tissue. And also in uh, mesial temporal sclerosis, most of the time where people uh, recur after, um, uh, after uh, selective amygdalohippocampectomy, let's say, or temporal uh, lobe uh, uh, epilepsy, most of the time it's because there's remnant and there's not enough resection of the hippocampus and parahippocampus and amygdala. And usually what we do, we, we put electrodes and we verify that the seizures are coming from those structures and we go ahead and we complete the resection. So there are cases we have failure because uh, not efficient resection of the, uh, so, so yes, there, there have been lots of theories about uh, the gliosis and it does make sense because even a trauma uh, without surgery, somebody who has a trauma and has scarring from trauma also can develop epilepsy. Uh, but in, uh, in my practice and uh, I, I have not seen that. Thank you. Uh, another question from an Iraqi neurologist, uh, Dr. Adil Yasin. He said that in your table, the number of patients is less than the number of operations. Uh, do this mean, uh, so does this mean that the uh, repeat failed operations, I mean, the, there is some re-operations on the same patient? Uh, you're talking about the table with the complication, the complication, the risk of complication. I think, I think he's talking about this one, yeah. So yeah, usually uh, when people present their results uh, for complication or for other types, usually, yes, you have, uh, this is not my data. This is the, the one for the complication is the one from the Montreal Neurological Institute. And they looked at all their cases and they are uh, patients, uh, they, uh, definitely some patients had repeat surgery either because they had electrodes inserted first and then resection or a resection that failed and they had to do other resection. But majority, I would say, due to, to the fact that they had electrodes first and then a resection. Oh, well, that's a question from uh, Shahinaz, the chair of International League against the Russian Mediterranean uh, region. Uh, is there any advance on technical uh, uh, aspect of surgery about hemispherotomy on dominant hemisphere? Yeah, so um, I did not go uh, into much details about that because this is pediatric uh, epilepsy and I haven't touched that for a while since <laughs> my, my fellowship. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so there's, uh, uh, there's the hemispherectomy and hemispherotomy. Hemispherectomy where we do remove uh, half of the, uh, we remove one hemisphere, complete hemisphere. Uh, and the hemispherotomy where we do um, uh, um, disconnection between the different uh, uh, hemispheres, uh, which includes uh, a temporal lobectomy and um, callosotomy uh, and also posterior disconnection. Uh, there are different techniques that have been uh, described and some people uh, up to this point, there are some people who believe more on the hemispherectomy and others that do hemispherotomy. There are advantages and risk for, for both techniques. Um, but uh, there's also the uh, hemispherotomy that is uh, a transinsular hemispherotomy that have been uh, developed by Villemur and Al, where they go, uh, they do, uh, uh, it's kind of um, minimally invasive, if you want, uh, technique to approach from a single, uh, for a small craniotomy where we can go uh, above, uh, go uh, above and uh, posterior and inferior to the insula and do all the disconnection with a relatively uh, small uh, craniotomy. But again, this is, uh, this is really more done in pediatric and, and I haven't touched that for, for a while. Well, another question from uh, Dr. Sami. Do you have patients with complete recovery after surgery without need for AIDS? 
and I have yeah. a question after that regarding yeah. this one. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, we have collected our data uh, lately, and um, uh, we uh, we have uh, I would say a majority of our patients, uh, uh, eighty to ninety percent of our patients that are seizure free, uh, with a follow up of up to ten years now. They and uh, not all of them we we stop their medication. Majority will tell them we stop it. Uh, we start to lower it only after one year. Uh, as recommended, and then uh, we uh, lower it. But many patients decide on their own, I don't have seizure, I just want to stop it. And uh, surprisingly, many of them uh, don't develop seizure anymore. And uh, actually, my neurologists say, I just lose them. I don't see them anymore. They don't come to see me. So, uh, And uh, they decide to stop their medication. And uh, uh, the majority in our, in our series, up to 80%, 80% uh, no, no uh, seizure at, uh, within a follow-up of 10 years. And we have, uh, I would say, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think uh, at least half of them, they, they uh, probably, let's say 30% of them, they stop completely the medication. Either they tell, uh, they tell the neurologue or they don't tell him. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my question in relative to this uh, answer of you, uh, in, uh, after the Surgery, a resection of temporal lobe resection. Is there is, uh, any cognitive, this, uh, cognitive changes in the uh, left, uh, left uh, temporal uh, resection versus the right temporal resection in your practice or knowledge? Yeah, so we do evaluate all our patients with neuropsychology tests pre and post op. And, uh, and, uh, there is uh, usually there's about 20 to 30 percent of those patients operated on the left side who would have some memory issue on uh, on paper. So when they do the uh, when they do the neuropsych test, uh, they they tell us that there is a significant decrease in uh, verbal memory and sometimes in in uh, speech function. But when you do ask the patient, they don't see any difference in their real, real life. When they talk to you, you don't see that they're having. Some of them will tell you, oh, sometimes I have difficulty finding words. Uh, some of them will tell you, oh, I have to take uh, more notes. But uh, even those who have, who score, uh, the score is kind of scary on the on the neuropsych, they say in their real life, they, they don't see much difference. Oh, I uh, just want to cite a comment uh, from Professor uh, Mr. Mr. Silwe, which is working a prominent new, uh, uh, epilepsy surgeon, surgeon in King College Hospital. Uh, he got he a lot of evaluation really. He uh, comments uh, one time that uh, there is some sort of an increase in the suicide and those who are very free of uh, seizures uh, since they find themselves say with no more no more care after being cared for and no more chance for a job, uh, no more chance for uh, say education that is not enough uh, and social social they are not well accepted still repelled uh, yeah. do you have a comment over this yeah the, thanks god nobody of my patient commits on the side but we did we did see actually that's true we did see uh, patients with uh, 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 deterioration of depression or appearance of depression that was not there I have in mind uh, one patient who is completely seizure free, everything's fine, but he had a very bad depression, he, not enough to go to suicide, but it was very bad. And even he, uh, he, he wondered if it was worthwhile to do the surgery, even if he's seizure free. Uh, fortunately, he got better after it took him a couple of years to, to, to get out of this depression. We did review of the literature and there is um, uh, clear reports on uh, about 10% uh, of patients getting uh, some, um, some kind of deterioration or appearance of new depression or anxiety. Uh, so I, when I counsel my patients before surgery, I do mention those numbers. And if we have patients, this is usually the risk factors for that is mainly patients who already have a history of anxiety or depression. And uh, when we do have that red flag, we uh, ask uh, consultation of psychology, psychiatry 
and psychology pre and post op to to make sure that they don't uh, they don't go da down downhill afterwards. Okay. Well, one question: uh, Can surgery be beneficial in infantile spasm? Uh, well, I guess uh, from your question that you're working with pediatric, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not this is not my question. Yeah, this yeah, is not one of the audience. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, I don't have an answer to your question. As I said, I haven't done uh, p uh, pediatric surgery for more than ten years now. Um, uh, I don't want to give you an answer off my hand without, without uh, knowledge. I don't, I don't have answer to right. your. Question. Well, about lit LIWT can be done for multiple foci of Caesar. Yes, so now the LIT is the big star in epilepsy surgery and even in neurosurgery for tumor and for, uh, uh, for epilepsy. And uh, so uh, I think the, the ones that are used the most in epilepsy is really for um, uh, mesial temporal sclerosis. Uh, they, uh, they had, um, I didn't talk much about it, but I knew people would be interested into that. So. Uh, so uh, the numbers are encouraging from the complication rates and from the response. The response is a little bit less than open surgery. And uh, unfortunately, the, the technique is not available at all centers, uh, but there is uh, there's big interest in this technique. Uh, we're trying hard to get this, te this technique in our hospital. I've been working to get it in the last three years and uh, hopefully we'll get it soon. And uh, okay. so people have uh, described it and uh, uh, described it a lot in, in mesial temporal sclerosis, uh, where you can use many targets because the hippocampus is, is as you know, is a C-shaped uh, structure. So people have used it to plan different lesions within the hippocampus and uh, amygdala sometimes and the parahippocampus, and usually try to make it all on the same track. Uh, it have also been used for callosotomies. They have, people have used it for callosotomy where they also make uh, either with a single track or multiple tracks. Uh, can it be used for multiple lesions? Um, technically, yes. Uh, could be used, for example, in cases where uh, you have uh, focal dysplasia, where have multiple cases of focal dysplasia or cases with uh, Tuberous sclerosis, I guess, uh, if you're thinking about that uh, when you ask questions. So technically, yes, it is. Uh, I haven't seen many reports on cases where they, where they do multiple lesions, but definitely it's technically feasible. Well, uh, one question from Samson, maybe the last question. Uh, how would you approach a patient with a bilateral hippocampus sclerosis and, and control seizure for refractor epilepsy with both sides? Uh, Hippocampal sclerosis. So initially we used to tell him he is not a surgical candidate. And now I think we have many options. I actually, uh, as I described, there's a DBS, I think is an interesting option because you do not make lesion in the, uh, in the uh, temporal lobes. Uh, because if you do destroy uh, t both temporal lobes, as you know, you can have the clover Bucy syndrome, which is not very nice. Uh, and uh, you can have severe amnesia and so on. Uh, so uh, before I've seen I've seen reports, uh, old reports where they would go with the with the uh, with the side where there's more seizures. So there have been reports where they would do single uh, uh, a temporal lobectomy or selective uh, to remove the place where there's more seizures coming from. They say if they, you have. 70% uh, on one side, 30% on the other side, uh, you can go ahead and take the place where you have 70%. And people did have some success with that. Uh, the, uh, the other option is, as I said, you can go with DBS because you do not destroy the lesion, you just do electrical stimulation. And um, so this would be interesting option. Uh, again, not all the centers, they have uh, this, um, uh, uh, this technique, this technology. Uh, thank you. One question which I didn't understand very well is they, in comparison with the VNS, what do you prefer and why? If you understand something of that question. VNS versus corpus callosotomy? 
No, no, in comparison with DNS, what do you prefer and why? This is the question. I don't know. Uh, DNS I don't compared to what? I don't so know. VNS, the question, the question is as such. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so VNS is classically compared to corpus callosotomy. And uh, mm. so uh, corpus callosotomy is relatively bigger surgery. There's a higher risk. Um, and uh, uh, But you have better uh, result for seizure control. So with the corpus callosotomy, let's say for the drop attack and uh, uh, generalized seizures, you have about 75 to 80% chance of decreasing the seizures by 75 or 80%. Whereas VNS, you have a smaller chance of improving seizures. Uh, they talk about 50% chance of decreasing the, the seizures by 50%, but it's a relatively uh, uh, less risky surgery and, uh, uh, and uh, it's not reversible. So you're doing stimulation where you're not destroying you're not destroying structures. So, so it depends on the, on the patient, how yeah. uh, sick he is, what is exactly his pathology. Is he willing to take the risk of doing uh, uh, the callosotomy or not? And uh, so it's all about, uh, and so, so other factors to be considered is, is the surgeon uh, comfortable by doing one technique or the other? And also the, the, the VNS is, a, 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 is very costly technique. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but here we have quotas to how, much, how many VNS we can implant at each region. Uh, and uh, so this also could be a limiting factor. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very nice presentation. And you really uh, give us uh, enough time for the answers and uh, questions which is usually, you know, more beneficial even than. <laughs> <laughs> I find this is the first time I register myself first, and I think it's very nice because exactly you, you, it's it's more more uh, practical. I think it gives more time at the end. Yeah, thank you very much. For thanks, this nice thanks for inviting me again. Thank you. Have a good day. Good day. Bye bye. Uh, well. Uh, Dr. Adil, I shift to you if there is a, if you present. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Raib. Thank you, Dr. Ranel, for uh, this excellent uh, lecture and uh, presentation, uh, really. And I pass for the next speaker and the next uh, presentation. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Narmeen Adel Kishik uh, from Egypt. She, she is currently a full professor of neurology at Cairo University since 2014. After completing her residency training at the neurology department in Cairo University hospitals, she has multiple fields of interest. She focused on epilepsy a clinic since 2004. After that, 2010, she became the moderator of the epilepsy clinic and chair in the, in the upgrading into epilepsy unit. Uh, she joined many international education EEG and epilepsy courses and, and schools. Uh, she is the vice president, secretary general of the Egypt Society Against Epilepsy, chapter of the International League Against Epilepsy and John ILE COVID task forces as a representative of Eastern Mediterranean. She is the principal investigator for ongoing national uh, research in her university focused on drug resistance epilepsy. She, her presentation is titled Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. Dr. Narmil's pleasure, you can start. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for kind invitation to share in ILE scientific activity. Today, we will try to answer this question, how do you catch the silent curve in people with epilepsy? I have nothing to disclose. 
All of us know that deep blue with epilepsy phase greatly increased the prevalence of premature mortality. And the most recent real life example for this silent killer represented through the tragic death of the Disney star Cameron Boise, where Sudi was uh, one to play. Uh, Cameron diagnosed as the epileptic at uh, 17 years old. His seizures were infrequent, but were exclusively nocturnal. His parents reflected their grief by launch uh, a campaign called No Sudib Now. And from my perspective, uh, I try to answer this question, uh, what is the magnitude and the classification of mortality in people with epilepsy? Know your enemy, who is the silent killer, who are the highly susceptible victims between our patients, and how can we catch the potential killer to protect our patient? As we all know, the epilepsy mortality may be direct cause, which is the most catastrophic cause uh, and un, uh, still not well understood uh, so the sudden unexplained uh, death uh, in epilepsy, uh, accident and or drowning, um, the acute or the emergency related like stiff epilepticus, symptomatic seizure or seizure clustering, also indirect cause uh, as suicide, uh, which is reflecting the suffering of our patient uh, as the stigma, severe depression, uh, also the chronic adverse event of anti-seizure medication or the other neurological uh, comorbidity between epileptic patients. It was found that overall mortality between people with uh, epilepsy ranging from 1.6 to 11 times greater than the general population. And also standardized mortality uh, ratio uh, became doubled between new onset uh, diagnosis uh, uh, and also increasing to treble for the chronic uh, epileptic, especially with remote symptomatic etiology. Also, as we can see in, uh, in this uh, uh, figure illustrating the, the result of four different study, community based and population based study, uh, between uh, childhood onset epilepsy, which uh, um, the result, uh, as we can uh, see, the sort of account for the most epilepsy related uh, deaths, especially with long duration of epilepsy and between adolescence. So we try to know um, what is SUDEP and uh, what, what, he, what its incidence uh, and also the pathophysiology. In a very simple way, SUDEP defined as any epileptic patient died suddenly without a good reason. Sudden, unexpected, non-traumatic, non-drowning, with or without witness, with no structural cause, no any status, and uh, but in mostly in a benign circumstances, circumstances related or not to seizure. This is a clinical uh, criteria to uh, define SUDEP. Near SUDEP means that the patient who survived after one hour from cardiorespiratory arrest. However, near fatal SODEP is a patient who passed away after one hour of cardiorespiratory arrest. We can categorize SODEP according to the confirmation of the diagnosis into possible SODEP uh, with a competing cause of death like comorbid hepatic renal disorder that may share in mechanism of death. Probable so that meet all clinical criteria, as I, as I mentioned, but with no available post-mortem autopsy. Define so definite SODEP, which confirmed by post-mortem autopsy without any anatomical or toxicological uh, causes. Also, SODEP plus another term used in many studies, which could have SODEP um, with another condition, which could have contributed to uh, the death, 
for example, um, um, autopsy showed coronary insufficiency without definite myocardial infarction. From different sort of registry, it was found that um, in the North American sort of registry, Danish and, um, and, and also in Denmark, uh, many, many registry um, studies that the sort of, uh, distribution between uh, different uh, population. Um, and we uh, found in most of the study that uh, usually uh, sort of is uh, targets preferentially younger people ranging from 20 to 50 um, years old. In a childhood epilepsy, it's a rare risk. Two child every 10,000 per year. However, in the adult with epilepsy, it is considered a small risk. One every 1,000 every year. So don't overestimate or underestimate the risk of SODIP. Also, as regarding the epilepsy population, um, there is different um, uh, epilepsy subpopulation. As we can see here, the incidence of SODIP between epilepsy clinic is less than which uh, epilepsy, epileptic patient with uh, intellectual disability, and the incidence increasing to four per thousand and up to six per thousand in uh, drug-resistant epilepsy and who needed uh, surgery, surgery um, or vagal nerve stimulation. Also, this uh, figure um, uh, um, showing the, the, the result of 26 study in different epilepsy population, as we can see here in outpatient clinic, there is a low risk, uh, uh, a high risk uh, increase in uh, the risk increase in DRE group and the uh, increasing more in the surgical group. After that, SOTIB is still, we all of us know that SOTIB is still not well understood. However, SOTIB can occur uh, related to the seizure itself, the presence of epilepsy, and also there is a common factor between heart and the brain. Let us start with uh, uh, how seizure itself may uh, um, cause SOTIB or explain the occurrence of SOTIB. In most uh, uh, researches, uh, um, it represented that seizure uh, when uh, the firing occurred in any um, cortical uh, region, um, especially on the right hemisphere, temporal insula uh, has a pressure response, uh, manifested as tachycardia, tachyarrhythmia, or if the uh, seizure originating from the left side, most of the study um, uh, proved that that can be causing a depressive response and causing bradycardia or asystole. Also, as you can see on the left side of my screen, uh, the cingulate, uh, the salamus, especially the, the posterior nucleus, which is uh, sensitive to hypoxia, and also the propagation to the brain stem um, nuclei can affecting the cardiorespiratory regulation. Uh, the, this uh, this figure uh, illustrates uh, the, the the way of seizure propagation, which may be reached to the cardiovascular uh, uh, control, sympathetic and parasympathetic, lead to ictal arrhythmia. As we can see, the the percentage of uh, bradycardia uh, cardio or asystole is lesser, but more dangerous. Um, uh, and also when propagated to the respiratory center, the arousal uh, center, uh, leading to um, decreasing more inhibition of this neuron, leading to decreased serotonin, noradrenaline, acetylcholine, and glutamate, all of these um, uh, may lead to impair in the arousal, impair in the carbon uh, dioxide sensor. Consequently, uh, on the clinical aspect, uh, all of these cause ictal apnea and also boost the ictal coma. Some patient has a semiology uh, in the area of belly cervian, which uh, insular uh, epilepsy, causing laryngeal spasm and consequently causing obstructed uh, apnea. 
what about the post-ectal uh, state? Uh, as regarding the post-ectal uh, suppression, which reflect this regulation of cardiorespiratory and autonomic connection and cause fatal consequences. As the level of, of the lung, there is hypoxia, hypercapnia, pulmonary edema, decre which decrease, also decrease in the respiratory drive. At the level of the heart, uh, it, the patient may uh, develop a post-ectal arrhythmia, which is more dangerous than ectal one. As ectal one, usually self-limited uh, uh, by the cerebral anoxia, caused by the uh, ectal asystole. Also, uh, post ectal coma with delayed arousal due to loss of protective uh, airway uh, commonly occurred in patients developed JTCs during REM sleep, especially if, uh, uh, if he was on the prone position. As regarding in the uh, epilepsy monitoring unit, um, excessive neuronal uh, inhibition uh, leading to an EEG shutdown, which can manifest it by um, post ectal generalized EEG suppression. As we can see, there's a seizure followed by EEG suppression, which called post ectal generalized EEG suppression. And in some researches, it may be considered as an equivocal biomarker of uh, uh, pseudobreast. And this finding is um, try is become more confirmed or uh, 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 in 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 the in the Morton's uh, study, which is a retrograde uh, retrospective uh, study mortality in epilepsy monitoring unit uh, study, uh, including 147 uh, epilepsy monitoring units uh, all over Europe uh, to investigate the main mechanism of uh, uh, cardiorespiratory arrest between 29 uh, patients. Four of them proved non-SODEP, nine of them diagnosed as near SODEP, 14 out of 16 diagnosed as definite or probable SODEP at night. The most consistent finding in is, is um, uh, after GTCs, there is a increasing in the uh, breathing rate up to 50 breaths per minute, followed by cardiorespiratory dysfunction within three minutes, then terminal apnea occurring within 11 minutes of the end of the seizure. And when analyzed this uh, result, the most important causes uh, of such catastrophic event were aggravated by suboptimal supervision during night time and withdrawal of anti-seizure medication. Let us share, uh, share with me the, the data of uh, this uh, lucky man. He is a, a 40 year old uh, epileptic man diagnosed as epilepsy at age of 23. Uh, we um, uh, examine him, there is normal neurological examination, normal MRI, conventional EEG. Um, his is a a seizure type uh, was focal, unaware with bilateral tonic-clonic seizure. He receiving the medication full doses up to three medication. However, uh, his wife reported that uh, he uh, in the last year started to develop total loss of consciousness, balor, and falling down without definite motor phenomena. So we record the event in our unit for this lucky man, uh, which reveal that. I will try to... Um, the video starting, the event occurred, 15 minutes min loss of contact, patient became unaware with a stereotyped motor autonomic on the right, left, uh, right, then left uh, hand and lower limb. His father trying to uh, asking him uh, to respond, but uh, 
the patient not responding, unaware, still a risk of behavior here. And then head turn to the, to the left side of the patient with tonic uh, puncture. Then atonia stumped to the right side for just a few seconds and then followed by extensor tonic puncturing of the right upper limb with brief myoclonic jerk. And this is a compressed EEG box showing the rhythm and a rhythmic alpha activity, uh, ectal rhythmic alpha activity on the uh, left temporal, followed by uh, evolution uh, to theta and delta and spreading to the right hemisphere. But the most striking finding here, as you can see, there is a five second of after uh, after the uh, few seconds from the start of the ectal rhythm, there's five seconds of bradycardia and nine second ectal asystole, as you can see. We try to um, um, apply the the pathophysiology and the try to explain the mechanism uh, of uh, this ectal asystole, and we found that the patient. Um, developed focal unaware seizure, which propagated to, uh, to a cerebrogenic uh, area causing vagal stimulation, ectal uh, bradyly then asystole. Uh, when ectal asystole occurred, consequently, there is cerebral anoxia, hypoperfusion, which usually terminate the seizure, and then the patient uh, become um, high, uh, atonic and then enter in uh, what is called convulsive syncope, uh, a puncturing due to the second after uh, regaining the heart rate. So this is, uh, I think, is a, a good example of potentially preventable and uh, treatable uh, cause uh, uh, of risk of SUDIP. Uh, our patient has asystole more than six minutes, so it is he is a candidate for uh, uh, um, double chamber pacemaker, and already the patient performed uh, by our cardiologist, and uh, become um, uh, very well. The seizure control, uh, the attack not occurred uh, um, since the application of uh, pacemaker. Uh, apart from uh, the focal unaware, which is uh, occurring infrequent every uh, six months. The presence of epilepsy itself. As we all know, drug-resistant epilepsy associated with low vagal tone and the high sympathetic tone, which lead to both of them heart decrease in the heart rate variability and also tachycardia. Both of them can be uh, a risk for sudden cardiac arrest. And this confirmed in the arrest study, which diagnosed uh, epilepsy. Um, this study just uh, studying the, the, the different causes and risk of sudden cardiac death between uh, more than 1,000 um, uh, individuals. Um, they diagnosed uh, a 12 uh, epileptic patient in the, uh, um, the group of sudden cardiac deaths and in the control group. And after uh, con uh, ass assessing the relative risk for sudden cardiac arrest between uh, the patient group and uh, the control group, uh, they was, uh, found that epilepsy was associated with the threefold increased risk for sudden cardiac arrest, especially between, uh, particularly between young and female. What about the common factor between heart and the brain, which can predispose or increase risk of SUDEP? As we all, all know, the cardiomyocyte action potential is similar to um, uh, the neuronal action potential. 
uh, and there is an entity between them uh, called neurocardiac channelopathy gene. So different um, uh, patients may develop long QT syndromes or maybe develop seizure or both together. And in, uh, in one of the study found that the whole exome sequencing for who died of sodium had unique variants in both cardiac conduction and synaptic transmission signaling pathway. And also from uh, our side, uh, there is um, uh, some evidence that 49% of deaths between Dravet syndrome uh, due to sodium, uh, due to sodium. We must be aware to read basic ECG. And uh, the most common finding we need to uh, look, uh, search for is the QT interval. As we can see, there is a, a corrected QT interval, um, different in the cutoff point between male and the female. And also the, the T wave uh, morphology, there is a, what is called T wave alternate. As you can see, there is low amplitude here, high uh, normal amplitude and so on, what's called T wave alternate. Both of them um, considered as a risk factor for uh, ventricular arrhythmia. And such a ventricular arrhythmia can progress to ventricular fibrillation and ending to uh, leading to car a sudden cardiac death. In our uh, center, we study um, um, the, the frequency of cardiac repolarization disorder, uh, especially the long QT, corrected long QT interval between among uh, 1,000 uh, people with epilepsy versus control, and they're trying to associate uh, between their occurrence uh, and any of the demographic or epilepsy related uh, features. The, we found that uh, there is a significant increase in the prolonged uh, QT interval in the epileptic patient compared to non-epileptic. And when we uh, do uh, some sort of uh, uh, regression analysis, uh, we, after controlling all other factors, we found that uh, the age and uncontrolled seizure has a rule can or can predict the presence of uh, long, prolonged QT interval. As we can see, uh, every one year increase in our uh, in age in our, between our patients, the risk of prolonged QT increased by about 3%. And uh, people with uncontrolled seizure, the risk of prolonged QT increased uh, by 80% compared to the control seizure. After we try to understand the pathophysiology of SUDIP, who are the highly susceptible victims? Identify which patients are, uh, are at risk. There is a different uh, study, um, um, study the, the, the factors uh, which is maybe modifiable or non-modifiable risk factor for so the, between our between the patient. Uh, the first and the most important one is the presence of generalized tonic-clonic seizure, especially if uncontrolled, and especially if, uh, if occurred nocturnal and the patient was in prone position. Patient uh, who develop a polytherapy, the breast. And also the non-modifiable long-standing EEG, uh, long-standing uh, epilepsy, uh, an age of onset is lesser than 16. Uh, uh, most of the of the study uh, showed that the male um, uh, sex more in, than in female prone to SUDEP. Um, the genetic susceptibility of long QT uh, interval prolongation and the low IQ or abnormal MRI. And don't miss, don't forget the insular epilepsy. Um, after, after we um, revise together the, the modifiable and non-modifiable uh, risk factor, uh, one of the most hot topic now in epilepsy community is trying to determine uh, potential uh, biomarkers for risk stratification of patients susceptible to so the most well understood clinical biomarker is the uncontrolled 
generalized tonic clonic seizure. The vast majority of sodium occur in aftermath of GTCs, uh, which illustrated here in the uh, Kaplan-Meier curve, as, as we can see, um, more is the risk in, uh, increase when the GTC occurred uh, more than three times per year. And uh, in another uh, way to, uh, of expression, uh, three GTCs per year have a 15-fold increased risk of sodium. Uh, also, there is uh, another uh, entity of biomarker uh, still need more study. However, uh, in the structural MRI, there is a court, uh, finding like cortical thickening and thinning in, uh, in general tonic clonic seizure, subcortical volume alteration, uh, brain stem or, and the cerebellar uh, volume loss. All of these um, um, have main concept, which is loss or, or impaired connectivity in some uh, area like thalamus, brain stem, and the frontal region. And on the other side, tissue gain um, and increase connectivity in the limbic system, insula, and the sensory side. All of these claim as a high risk of sodium. Uh, don't forget the uh, very simple my market long QT interval and also the equivocal um, uh, biomarker, which is the uh, generalized suppression uh, post ectally. In one study, there is an autopsy analysis. Uh, they found that uh, a significant upregulation of uh, a certain microRNA in plasma and the hippocampus of a sodium case compared with uh, control. So, after we um, we study the, the, the risk factor, um, to tell or not to tell? When, how, and what, what to tell? What to tell to, you, to, you, our, uh, to our patient? I came across, uh, which explains the concept of uh, SUDIP, and I see uh, all these fishes. So um, uh, I think we, we need to incorporate a brief semi structural risk uh, assessment in routine clinical practice, such as uh, seizure safety, a checklist, uh, and also uh, the NICE guideline recommend, uh, recommendation um, uh, Tailored information according to person's risk of sodium is the, the best way. At the end, and the last question, can we prevent epilepsy-related mortality? Can we catch the potentially killer? Um, the answer is yes, through three lines. The first line is the medical treatment. Uh, as you can see, this uh, meta-analysis, uh, including uh, 112 randomized controlled trial, um, trying to uh, study the effect of uh, compliance and taking efficacious anti-epileptic drugs compared to placebo. And uh, they concluded that active treatment reduced mortality by up to seven times, mostly due to reducing seizure frequency and severity. And by the way, all of us know that medical, proper medical treatment um, can be uh, effective uh, from 50 to 70% of uh, our epileptic patients. Medical treatment, which drug, what is next? Please, after we revise uh, the common uh, association between heart and the brain and uh, what is called the neurocardiac channelopathy, try to avoid drugs which causing depolarization uh, block, like phenytoin, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, and the other drug, lacuzamide, rufinamide, and also polycerapy for uh, the effect of drug-drug interaction, especially in the, lem in the genetically prone individuals. And try to push your patient to be uh, to be uh, adherent well to the anti seizure medication. And don't forget the base maker implantation, uh, which saved our patient. Uh, and when the patient became uh, DRE and not surgery candidate, 
uh, try to shift to another non-pharmacological strategy like neuromodulation uh, and also ketogenic diet, especially in the pediatric age group. The second line is the surgical uh, line. Um, as you can see in this uh, interesting study about uh, temporal loop epilepsy outcome, patient um, uh, showed that uh, the standardized uh, mortality uh, uh, ratio is 3.6, which means that the patient with seizure were 3.6 times as likely to die during the study uh, period, which is the 12 years, than the normal population. And if the patient proceed, uh, proceeded to uh, surgery and became uh, seizure free, the risk declined to the level as in general population. However, this didn't occur in another group, uh, uh, which is a seizure is persist. And such, such miserable group uh, has increased risk of uh, standardized mortality ratio up to 7.4. And we can explain this by the long duration of epilepsy before surgery uh, decision. So I think it is a very good uh, lesson uh, to push our patient as early as possible for the non-pharmacological treatment, especially if he is surgically candid. The most important, and I think is a very uh, daily in a very in a daily practice uh, line of uh, uh, treatment or management or prevention, is the awareness and education. First uh, step, uh, we try to learn the patient, the caregiver, or even the the young generation, to educate the patient that safe sleep environment is very very important we can use a breathable pillow and also avoid a lot of soft bedding, try to avoid the prone position during sleep. The second, nocturnal supervision, uh, which reduces the risk of sleep up to 60% through room partner at least 10 years old uh, with normal IQ, regular check, and we can use nocturnal listening device causing 90% reduction. And also in the recent uh, uh, era, there is a sensor for clonic uh, motion. And don't forget, the most important point is the anesthesia medication adherence. Uh, so uh, at the end, I can conclude my, I need to conclude by these uh, three statements. We must rapidly improve physician, patient, and caregiver awareness about SUDIP. Stop seizure, especially in nocturnal and general tonic chronic seizure, overnight observation, consider early non-pharmacological treatment in DRE. Second, simultaneous video EEG and ECG recording is very, very important. Third, routine ECG should be required for people with epilepsy to help in choice of proper anti-seizure medication, especially who have family history of sudden uh, cardiac death. And at the end, uh, save uh, this date to save our patient uh, by revising the, the recent uh, uh, recommendation about SUDEP, the awareness about the SUDEP between patient and young physician. And thank you. Thank you, Narmin, for excellent uh, presentation again. And uh, I'm just, I'm looking at, we have just two, two questions now. I'm starting with uh, Dr. Shehnaz. She asked if there is any data from Mediterranean uh, region about the SIDM. Do you have something to tell us? Um, uh, unfortunately, there is no uh, well-studied uh, registry uh, for SODIP, 
Uh, however, uh, uh, in our uh, in our country, uh, we starting in our university uh, a study, and uh, soon we will publish uh, this study about uh, the different risk factor between our patient in uh, for sleep. And the second question from Fatima Kamun. Uh, she said in, in child with epileptic encephalopathy or simply epilepsy with the frequent status epilepticus, tonic and myoclonic atonic, we don't know to see them. Any explanation do you have? Uh, yes, it is uh, by uh, the registry, uh, as I mentioned in my third or fourth uh, slides, the, already the risk between childhood uh, uh, onset epilepsy is a little bit uh, more rare than the adult uh, or adolescence uh, period. So uh, I think this is the cause. Uh, and also um, um, the, the, the mortality rate uh, uh, in a child with epilepsy, uh, a little bit uh, uh, less than mortality rate in between adolescents and adults. And another question from uh, Sami Salang. Uh, do we have any lab or biomarkers for prediction syndrome? Uh, until now, no, uh, there is no definite biomark, laboratory biomarker, uh, except I, uh, I, I searched about this. I found uh, one study comparing um, just the eight individual uh, post-mortem about uh, microRNA. Uh, one uh, died by SUDEP and the other seven post-traumatic uh, deaths. Um, and um, just, just a, a very small uh, sample size. So I, I think there is no definite laboratory biomarker uh, for uh, for SUDIP. The most simple okay, way. Mm -hmm. yeah. You have some problem in the phone. You hear me? Did you hear me? I hear you bad. Now maybe yes. Yes. Okay. I mean. Okay. Okay. From Sausan El Bazi, can VNS increase risk of SIDA? Is there is a way to decrease that risk, if any? Uh, no, there is. Uh, uh, it is. Uh, I think it is uh, the study proves the opposite uh, way because uh, uh, the mortality rate and the SUDIP especially decreasing with the uh, uh, using of uh, application of vagal nerve stimulation. Again, another question from Fatma Abdullah. Uh, when do you tell the patient regarding SIDIP? Do you discuss it with all patients? Uh, definitely, uh, we start first uh, um, with the patient. Again, who, you have a bad, bad phone. You, you, are, you, you listen to me now? OK? Maybe. Okay, I hope. Yes, better. Yes. Okay. I will try to raise my voice. Okay, uh, many, um, uh, I think I start to discuss uh, the, the SUDIP issue uh, with a patient, especially uh, in adolescence or adult uh, with a generalized tonic seizure or mainly nocturnal seizure. And especially who, uh, the, the patient with um, not adherent to uh, his medication or uh, feel like uh, no problem to skip uh, one dose or two dose. I think this is the main uh, group we need to discuss. The second group is already the patient with drug-resistant epilepsy to convince uh, them to shift from medical uh, treatment to a non-pharmacological treatment like vagal nerve stimulation, ketogenic diet, or surgery. Um, uh, but not all patients uh, must be discussed uh, in a frank way, but uh, just uh, tell the patient that uh, your life in, is... Uh, you, you can expose to, uh, to a trauma, you can expose to uh, sudden, uh, sudden arrest in the heart due to uh, non-compliant or uh, due to um, uh, lack of uh, uh, self-confidence. Uh, um, self, self because I think um, 
so, uh, patient to um, risk in SUDEP um, increased also in uh, patient who um, the breast because the breast patient uh, the most common patient uh, that not adherent to medication. Uh, so and if, if the patient is the, the breast, uh, he will not adhere to the medication, and th this is uh, considered uh, a risk of sodium. I have an from Osama Landuzi. Is there is a specific sign from never imagine but being high risk of sodium? Uh, as I mentioned, there is a many study uh, about the, the, the volumetry study about the, some cortical, subcortical region, brain stem and cerebellar, um, but still uh, a few study. Um, there is not definite, uh, it is just a, a, a small correlation. Um, and also the connectivity, there is uh, some uh, uh, low connectivity and the high connectivity in region, as I, I mentioned in my uh, talk, um, some connectivity, decreasing connectivity between uh, thalamus uh, insula, and also increasing connectivity between insula and the brain stem, uh, which increasing the, the propagation to um, brain stem nuclei and causing more suppression uh, of the arousal system. But no definite uh, biomarker, uh, neuro, uh, neuroimaging biomarker. Uh, from Noha Hassan, do we do ECG as a following up test for only genetically predisposing long QT patient or for a patient? Um, it's better. There is no definite recommendation for this, but it is um, it is recommended for a patient who has a history of uh, family member sudden cardiac arrest or even the patient developing any uh, cardiac uh, arrhythmia. So we, if the patient became epileptic, we must uh, do an ECG before starting the anti-epileptic medication. Uh, uh, and also, I, I think, uh, in my opinion, uh, we need to do an ECG for the, especially for the patient with drug-resistant epilepsy, because uh, it may be uh, all, all these patients on polymedication so we, we must uh, rule out the long QT or any uh, problem in the repolarization potential. I think I have some comment here. I think it must be a routine electrocardiogram. It is so, so important in the initial evaluation of patient with epilepsy. In addition, it is ruled in the diagnostic evaluation of seizure. I think it must be a routine test, EEG with the video, as you mentioned in your presentation, to do the EEG with the video, uh, uh, the ECG with the video EEG. I think yes. it's so important because it must be a routine, a routine yes. test for all patients. I, 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 I differentiate between when we do an EEG, we must do an ECG with the EEG. Yes. Uh, um, yes. I have a question you mentioned before, the CDB in children and in adults, huh? but uh, you didn't mention the elderly patient. Huh? Did you have any study about the elderly patients? Yes, um, there is uh, many, uh, some research about talking about the, the elderly and said that the elderly is not immune from SODIP, elderly epileptic patient not immune from SODIP. However, uh, the, the, an elderly patient um, mostly not searching for SUDIP by, uh, by post-mortem autopsy because mostly there is some uh, other causes of uh, deaths like cardi um, cardiac cause or respiratory cause. But uh, elderly not immune from SUDIP because it is in the registry North American or uh, Danish, there is an older uh, people uh, passed away due to SUDIP. I have some other question. I saw that there is a question in the, what about the association of sedum with the sleeping and sleeping related seizure? It is a very, very uh, important uh, question. Uh, the, um, the most common risk factor is uh, the generalized and also especially if during the sleep, 
because during sleep um, there is uh, no reflex uh, arousal uh, and if the seizure especially if the patient is in a prone position is very dangerous because uh, maybe the patient passed away if there is no super supervision and uh, as we uh, we mentioned that uh, um, so you have a um, bad bad microphone i <clears throat> I didn't hear you, Nermin. I'm sorry. Um, you have some problem, problem? Just a moment. You heard me now? Yes, much better. You heard me now? OK. Yes, yes. Uh, so I, uh, I mentioned uh, that uh, uh, the most important patient who approach uh, about talking about SUDEP is a patient with uh, has a noctur exclusively nocturnal seizure because uh, nocturnal, uh, nocturnal seizure, especially if generalized and especially if the patient not, has no supervision, at a high risk of uh, the, the risk is increased triple. Again. Again, we are on the same problem. I'm, sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yeah. It's okay. The sound, the sound is clear mm, with us. No, no, we are not so so lucky. <laughs> you have the sound, again. Doctor Adel. Uh, the sound clear with you, us. I don't know. It's made problem me? with you. You hear me, Doctor Adel? Mm -hmm. you, you hear me? Yes, maybe, yeah. maybe it's okay. Okay. We, we hear you, Dr. Nermin. You can proceed. Okay. Okay. The okay. comment uh, uh, say that the, the voice is clear. Okay. 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 Uh, can, I, I, can, can I share, audience, Dr. Yeah. Adel? Uh, we have from Kusama Landuzi, can surgery be proposed in the early course of the disease for a definite subgroup of patients, and what are the inclusion criteria? Uh, for sure, the, the, the surgical line of treatment in epilepsy, if the patient has a, a epileptogenic lesion, uh, there is, uh, I think it, it must be a surgical candidate and uh, do an, as early as possible, especially in the pediatric age group. My sound is okay. clear? Yes, it's clear, yes. Okay. I just want uh, one comment okay. if uh, Dr. Adel no. allow me. Dr. Adel, can you yes. allow me to say something? Yes, yes, yeah. sure. You are yeah. I, I think the, the problem of the sound, I think it's with you, not with the, uh, the, the Dr. Nermin. Uh, anyway, I just want to uh, raise the point that uh, the first uh, uh, person neurologist who define the SODEP in the world is the Palestinian neurologist uh, Lena Nasher. You may know her, Dr. Uh, Adel. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She is my, my, my close friend now. Yeah, she is she, in England. Yeah, so that Unfortunately, is, she, left, she left Palestine and she lived in, in, in England. In UK. Yeah, in UK. Uh, yes. She, she the, should have, is linked to her name. Uh, well, and one my question, Dr. Nermin, uh, is about uh, carbamazepine. Carbamazepine, carbamazepine, you know, is linked in a way or another to sodium. Uh, yeah. Are there any other anti-seasonal drugs which are uh, related now or may raise uh, yeah, a, a bit, uh, the, the sodium ratio? Okay, there is, a some, uh, there is some study uh, about the anti relation of anti-epileptic drugs with sodium, especially the depolarizing uh, blocking drugs. Uh, like uh, phenytoin, uh, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, and also lacuzamide um, and rufinamide, not available in our country, but rufinamide also. Um, uh, all of these can, uh, is, uh, yeah, were claimed, but there is no definite uh, risk. And we can, must be aware of using these drugs, especially on a genetically uh, uh, prone uh, individual. So this drug, if the patient has family history of sudden cardiac arrest, or uh, with, we notice that there is a long QT interval on routine ECG, we must avoid this medication uh, uh, more better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adel, for this uh, chance.
هو قبل لي دكتور عادل هو هير ايه هير بعد انا سو سوري ما اي اي دونت نو اف ذا بروبلم از جينيري اور جاست وذ ذا وذ مي ديد يو هير مي ناو يا 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 يس يس اوكي ان مين اي هاف انذر كويستشن اي سو ذي وات اباوت ذا ميني ذا درافيك سيندروم اف ذير از يو نو ذا سيفير ماي كرونيك ابيليتي ديد يو نيت اور يو هاف سم انفورميشن اباوت درافيك سيندروم وذ سيندروم Yes, it is in a, in a one study reported that 49% uh, of uh, suited case uh, due to uh, when studying the mortality between uh, Dravé syndrome found that suited account for uh, 49% uh, uh, of the cases. You know that uh, uh, Dravé is a sodium channel mutation. Uh, and uh, it may be prone for this uh, for this condition, especially with the poly medication and the drug resistant epilepsy and the frequency of seizure, even a nocturnal uh, seizure. Okay, I so there is no more question. Uh, I would like again to thank you, to Namin. Uh, for uh, excellent lecture and the presentation and for your patience to answer all these questions Thank from you. the audience and the part of me. I'm so happy to meet all of you, Raiv and uh, Ramiz and Ramin and uh, the audience. Uh, I hope to meet you again in the next uh, webinar. Raiv, if you, if you want something to comment, Oh, thank, thank you very much, and we thank both uh, lecturers. I just want to, to, to say that uh, the question of to tell or not to tell about SUDEB uh, is really a problem in our society. Yeah. Uh, in the world, it, may, it is no longer a problem because, you know, they, there is uh, internet and uh, a lot of readings that the family can know from here or there. In our society, the oriental world, uh, especially in rural areas, uh, I mean in urban areas, uh, or I mean rural, that's not in cities, or that, or in the, uh, the, if you tell the, the patient, it is not a problem. The problem that his mother will die earlier, uh, 10 years, <laughs> so that he will lose the caregiver in our society. But, uh, but I think if, if the patient, uh, I, uh, the, 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 the approach for the patient and family might, must be individualized. So if the yeah. patient has a re, a, really a, a, a modifiable risk factor, uh, yeah. uh, frank to us and the obvious to us, we must discuss uh, by, uh, by the level of the, the patient. Uh, as, as we can see the level, if it's educated, not educated, we can, as a doctor, we can uh, transfer the information um, according to the, 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 the cultural level. I think it is my, uh, our rule. Yes, you are right. Thank you very much for you and for Dr. Adel, for, uh, for Dr. Ramiz, and for Mr. Dennis, who works a lot to uh, present this nice uh, presentation. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. And thank you, you all. See you, see you next thank you. Uh, thank webinar. You. Thank, you. Well, thank you for all of you. And I you. think we need to discuss AV with the patient, especially we have a comment from Dr. Shehnaz. Okay. She said that I think we need to discuss early with the patient, especially adolescents. I'm agree with the yes. Yes. comment. Yes. And I think all of us we are agree with the question. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Shina, for your comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank, you. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. We can close. Yeah. And yeah. have a nice end week. Uh, hope to you meet in the next webinar. Thank you. And, uh, thanks for all of you. Thank 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 you.